Perfect. Thanks, uh, Vince. So uh, Node-RED, I'm going to go through a bit of it that uh, introduce you to Node-RED. And, and what is Node-RED? I, I call it a programming language for, for people that don't program like me. We've all wanted to program. We've all got every book on our bookshelf, you know, intro to Java, intro to C Sharp, intro to C. But we were okay with basic, you know, and, and at least that's what worked for me. And uh, I'm just waiting to make sure this comes up correctly. And that's not correct. Let me redo the yeah, share. We're seeing your desktop, Mike. Good stuff. Let me stop and start over. Thanks, Rod. It should be screen three. There we go. And we'll see if that comes back. So we talked a little bit in the earlier talk about remoting. And uh, so we're going to skim over that. Um, as well, but this is this is what my first control panel or actually was the third one looked like. The first time I did it, you know, I did it like a repeater site where it was all beautiful and you know it was rack mounted and everything, and then it was really hard to work on as we moved on. And then the next time, it started to be a mess, and uh, so I got around to doing this, and this is right beside all the radios, and uh, we have this mess of stuff, and, and I'll come up to that later. And why do we want to remote? Well, in the HF world. And even the repeater world were remote repeaters because they're high, they're clear, and they give us better range. In the HF world, we do it to get away from HF noise. Uh, and some other reasons is none of us are getting any younger. Maybe we have friends that are shut-ins, uh, or you're going to be a shut-in, or you're moving into an apartment, but your buddy's got some real estate. And so we're seeing now that groups of hams are getting together to build a ham shack that they can use remotely. And uh, so we're going to get to the point where how we keep making this easier. Uh, these are some key things to consider. I mentioned earlier, you know, the internet is the tool that makes it conceivable today. Uh, in the earlier days of remoting, people had uh, UHF links or gigabit links uh, or microwave links to their radios. A lot of Californians had that, right, uh, George, where they, because it was easy for them to see the hilltop from the valley. Here in Ontario, that doesn't work. You know, you could see the building. Well, that's not going to be any more HF quieter. Uh, and we have things to consider, like controlling our antennas, controlling our rotor, turning on and off the power, rebooting things, and just recovering so we don't have to get in the car. So these are some of the devices that I've used in my earlier days. I still use that um, um, KMtronic web switch. Uh, it's a web-based switch, so I can put it on my LAN. And I can still get to it if everything fails. If I can get to my network in the house, I can go manually turn some buttons on and off. And this is sort of my fail safe switch. It controls some of the core power, the DC five volt control power for the Raspberry Pis. I use several, uh, the power for the PC because I, I highly recommend running a remote PC uh, with the uh, radio equipment you're using. And uh, I can spend a whole hour on why to do that. But the reason is I only have to configure, well, there's a couple. I only have to configure one PC for remote operation, maybe for my logbook, my digital programs, my or uh, or whatever. And today's world with the things of like any desk and team viewer or whatever, it makes it easy to get into uh, or control that, um, was it Chrome remote desktop, et cetera. So that's incredibly important. And uh, as we mentioned earlier, it's easier to get a network going. It's hard to do it right. And, you know, port forwarding, you can actually get around most of that today. Uh, this is some of, one of the items I've seen many people use for rotor control. It's the um, K3NG rotor controller. It's open sourced. You can use Pies or Arduinos or stuff to turn your rotor. Uh, there's a whole infrastructure built around these. And there's off-the-shelf remote control devices from uh, Remote Rig and uh, just about any rotor control box today. You can buy an add-on kit from um, Easy Rotor Control, Idiom Press, uh, a whole bunch of different others. So here's a shot of some of the... Um, the remote rig control box uh, on the right. And essentially it just mimics the brake and the left and right buttons that we have on most of our rotor controls. Spent a lot of time on this one. What about lightning? There's no app today that takes the coax and we will get to node red and throws it out the window. And that's really the only true lightning protection today is, is to totally disconnect if you're worried about your radio, every cable from it. That includes the DC power cables, even the ground cables, and certainly the coax cables. So what do we do? We do the best we can uh, with some polyphaser stuff. Maybe we use some relay control. But if you if you take a 
direct heads-on strike, you'll be doing some maintenance to find out, uh, you know, repairing stuff and getting uh, getting it back online. Um, that's just one of the risks we have with Lightning today. There's some cool things coming out that people are doing with linear actuators to pull the feed lines a foot apart. They will all help, uh, but it, it doesn't really uh, solve the problem. And if you uh, want to learn more about Lightning protect, uh, protection, you can read Ward Silver's book, uh, ARL sells it. I saw his presentation in the um, Contest University last uh, May. I thought I knew something about lightning pro protection. I learned I didn't know a thing about lightning protection. So if you want to learn more, you can go read about read Rod's book. And so how do we control things? So that's going to lead us right into our node red world. I showed you this earlier. Yes, this is a bit of a dog's breakfast, but we can see we've got a network switch. In the bottom uh, left, we've got some DC power control. How do we turn all that stuff on and off? Uh, I had a, a watt meter that would hang every once in a while, and it just needed the power cycle to it. So that got routed through another relay so that I could just, in the middle of a contest, power cycle the watt meter. Uh, I have uh, web switches. I had a Pi in the middle that had 16 relays on it using all the GPIO ports. Uh, it worked really well, but... Um, you want to make sure you have a device that if you reboot it, the relays don't reset because you don't want the power on your, your PC recycling. So that's why I have two different versions of web switches. Um, I'm also a lightning map uh, receiving station. So we have a lightning map controller. And uh, I, have a, I have a Raspberry Pi that its only job is to, uh, to make sure the internet's up. And it checks every 20 minutes. Can I ping three different sites? Are they there? Great. Two of them are gone. One of them is there. The internet's probably up. Uh, and its job is to reboot uh, the uh, router and the uh, and the modem. If that goes away, saying because that's the first thing your company tells you, your ISP. Well, did you reboot your modem and your router? So it automatically does that. The good news is today you can buy those things off the shelf on Amazon. And this is what the HF shack today looks like. Uh, this is an SO2R full legal limit shack in a box. Uh, and uh, why am I using such a big PC? Because it helps heat the box in the wintertime. Uh, and then why in the Astron 70 amp power supply in the bottom? Well, geez, couldn't use something a little more heat efficient? Absolutely. But this helps heat the box in the wintertime. So you sort of get the idea. I'm uh, fortunate to have access to a Power Genius uh, amplifier down here. And this is a Flex 6600 uh, in the middle. Let me get my pointer active. There it is. Here's the 6600. I've gone to using an LP100A watt meter. Uh, and that is not a web-based device, but you'll see later on how I made it a web-based device. And uh, it's also the most accurate watt meter I think you can get today. There's maybe two that accurately um, present peak envelope power. And this is just a drill in of what the rest of it looks like. And you can see now I've gone to two of these KMtronic web-based switches, but I can still control those with Node-RED. Those are the backup you know, web switches that have ports forwarded to them so I can get to them offline. Everything has a second path to it, just in case, except I only have one internet path. Uh, some ham stations have two internet paths. They may have a, a cellular data phone they can flip to if they have to, to get logged back inside, either to turn things off or to do additional diagnosis. And this is the operating position. Mm, that's taken a couple of weeks ago, pretty much what it looks like today. So yes, if you see me looking up in the air, I'm looking up at this monitor where your presentation is running. Okay, Node-RED. So Node-RED was developed by IBM actually quite a long time ago. And it's a machine-to-machine -machine communication tool. Uh, it's designed, uh, I truly think, for people who aren't programmers but are logical thinkers. And uh, you can tie all these nodes together and make it look like a web page. And I looked at it and went, I'm never going to learn this. And I actually learned, I was actually producing useful stuff within a few hours. Unlike the book of, let's see, I got Python, uh, Learning C Sharp 3.0. I mean, all those books are there that I can't program to save my life. So it's browser-based. Uh, so it's very gooey, uh, you know, what you see is what you get. But what I really love about Node-RED is somebody shares the code that they've written, which they've already done, it's easy to follow their logics through the flow. And we're gonna see how that works when we look at George's GPIO box. And there's a lot of libraries built in that are already written. 
I, uh, I wanted to know more about weather. Somebody had written a weather library that pulls the metadata from local airport. And then a little GUI pops up and says, hey, the temperature is and the wind's this. Maybe the wind's howling greater than 30 knots and it's out of the west. I can now send a rotor command and say, hey, turn the beam so it faces into the wind. So here's George's box. We've seen that earlier. Uh, I guess, I don't know, George, is this version one or two? Uh, but we've got eight, ray, eight, ray, yeah, blah, blah, eight relays. We can do voltage differential. I want you to notice that the voltage differential board is missing. And that's why I'm getting zero. At least that's what I thought you said. It plugs in uh, out here. That's right. Um, is that right? Yep, that's right. Okay, I was wondering why. I was going to ask you why I was getting zero. And then he sends me this list of commands. And he says, well, see what you can do. Well, we can see that in the raw commands, if we look up here, uh, we've got a relay command. Here's an example, turn relay three on. Okay, I can live with that. And then he said, we get this binary data back and it's the status of all eight relays. And, and then these digital inputs or whether they're high or low and the four voltage readings and then the differentials, right? Uh, and then he's got some addressing at the beginning, which I really should do something with, but I sort of got skipped over that. And that's pretty much all he gave me. And about two hours later, I turned it into a web page that looked like this, that not only works uh, on a web page, but it works on my iPhone, Android phone, whatever tablet you have. All this is running on a Raspberry Pi. So I have a Pi with a, uh, a USB adapter, it happens to be a 485 RS-485 adapter connected to it. Again, they're not very expensive. And lo and behold, here we go. I left the um, digital inputs, never got written, but uh, I could add those actually in about 10 minutes now. So let's look at how that works. This is the program. Wow. Well, how do we start? Well, I, this is, uh, we'll walk through the steps here to give you a clue. And, and as it breaks down, I think you'll see how easy it is. So we start here with a command called query, it sends his, um, he told me I'm doing it wrong, but it worked for me, slash ping command out to the USB port on the Pi. And that's connected to his GPIO board. And that's, uh, and that's cool. So that eventually goes away. And then the command comes back up here where we, um, we get the data from the serial port. So we get it in and then we come in and we start to play with a little bit. So uh, the next thing you know is we can, as the data comes in, we have to put it in some format. Again, these, these yellow things are tools of Node-RED. They actually convert the data from something like a string into something we can use. And I wanted it in an array. I didn't have to parse it on my own. There was all this array stuff built in and it produced all this data. Look at this, I've got it already. I've got, it's coming from unit, um, uh, from that unit, uh, this address, this is what I'm really paying attention to stuff, these eight bits are for the, you know, what status the relays are in. Uh, the next one um, is whether any digital inputs are high or low, then we get my voltages. So I just got wires jumpered across to the 12 volt line and over to the five volt line. And then um, I think this is a checksum, right? So you get the, you get the idea and we can parse those all out uh, again, with tools that are already built into Node-RED. And, uh, and they're called message payloads as we communicate the data from node to node. And there's a couple of other advanced features. But the point is, you know, we're just sharing information from one flow or one node to another. And in this case, in, in this Volts 3, here's a big ugly string. Well, how does that work? Actually, I was able to just drag that in from the previous debug window and say, just grab this data. Okay, now we're going to parse it out and we're going to send it to the web page and we'll show you the web page. Well, you've seen it already. The RBE means don't send it again unless it's really changed by 1%, 5% or some number and it helps eliminate any noise we may or may not see. So we look over here, we, we so I was going to go down this path of parsing out the web switch stuff for the zero, the eight bits. Uh, we come in here, we split them out in a switch. This is what they look like in a switch. Well, bit zero, bit one, bit two, bit three, bit four, you get the idea. Um, we change the component and we, and this is the web page part. This, this blue here, this light color blue is actually the button we're going to see on the web page. But the button has enough code in it to know if it's true or false. And if I push it to send out something on the other end, 
to turn the switch on and off. And we uh, we did a demo earlier with just four switches that we could make that just work. Look at this here now at the end. This is what the raw data looks like. We have uh, the raw data came in. Down here, we parsed it out to the uh, data we wanted. So that's what the relay one and relay uh, five are on. And over here, uh, we sent the ping command, slash slash ping, which I now need to do differently, out to the relay board. And that was it. Yes, looks a lot complicated. A lot of it's just really repetitive. So, um, and it's uh, the nice thing too is there's a whole lot of data available online to get you through this. So once we're done, I had a web page that looked like this. You saw this already. And on the right hand, I just took a screenshot in my cell phone. And while it sort of overflowed to the right, I can move it around with my finger and make changes as I want. So this is also means I could be in my car or anywhere else and have access, full control of the station. Okay, so that got you to, to George's web switch. Uh, what about some other stuff? Well, let's get through some of the intros first. This is some really cool documentation that's available on the Node-RED site. How to get started, uh, whether you wanna run Node-RED, so it's your interface control box. You can run it on a Windows PC, uh, you can run it on a BeagleBone Black, a Pi, uh, a number of things. They've designed it to make it truly platform agnostic. Then they have all these tutorials, uh, you know, the user guide, which whoever looks at the user guide, well, you should, but of course we don't understand enough of it. So I'll go right to the tutorials. We've got cookbooks of things that people have done. Uh, we've got uh, um, all sorts of different things. If we go to the next slide. There's a library here. Now, I forgot how many items. There's 3,000 things people have shared in the library. So if you also want to integrate Alexa or anything else into Node-RED and say, hey, Alexa, turn on my HF radio, you can do that. And you don't have to be a top-end developer programmer. Somebody has already done all that IoT stuff that makes it super easy to do. A uh, bit of education, yes, but very easy to test as well. We also have a group on uh, groups.io devoted to amateur radio. Now, a ton of it is flex centric, but that's okay because a lot of it's starting to come in now for the ICOM Kenwood Yesu world. A lot of Kenwood stuff because the Kenwood command set's fairly well known uh, to integrate other stuff. And I'm gonna show you a whole bunch of slides coming up to, to what people have done uh, to integrate their station into one application. The one thing is in my ham shack earlier, when I started out, I had a number of items. I had, I had to start a program for the for the amplifier, just start a program for the watt meter, just start a program for the antenna switch. And it was just, you know, in the early days it was cool, but it was clumsy. And I wanted always wanted one thing better. So the groups.io, uh, node-red sham radio at groups.io, and we are there to help you. So there is no, you're not gonna get, go read the manual. You might get, Go walk through the tutorial on this and, at, and come back if you have any questions. Um, Dave W02X, uh, W02X, who's retired and finds this incredibly relaxing, is actually going out and writing things for people as well. We've got uh, Andreas uh, from your neck of the woods, N6NU, uh, has been an amazing help. He was the one that uh, kicked us off on getting going this. He wrote some of the core stuff that we all took to the next level. So thanks to Andreas, and I apologize if I busted his call. Uh, we've got Alan Blind, who call, call sign escapes me, that has written some amazing, amazing everything, including satellite stuff uh, and a whole bunch of different things. So here's what, and we also have a wiki for you to get started on it and running Raspberry Pis. I, I think the Pi is the best thing to run your Node-RED platform on. It's got web servers and everything built in and it doesn't consume any power and it's easy to keep it up and running forever. Uh, some of the reference stuff, if you wanna take a screenshot of this or you can pause it. And again, you can certainly email me and I'll share this with you, but uh, it's also on the groups.io. And by the way, here's some of the stuff people have written already to integrate from amplifiers to automatic lightning disconnects if there's lightning within 50 miles, if they have fires off a whole bunch of relays to turn things off high SWR alarms, uh, stepper tuning, direct in integration to McDoppler, uh, reading the meters on all the flex radios, the power geniuses, uh, turning GPIO pins on and off, et cetera, et cetera. So a whole bunch of stuff. And then we have um, 
you know, this, I, I have actually, I deleted this whole flow because it was so simple, but you can go buy this relay on Amazon for $9, plug it into a Raspberry Pi and have four relays that you can control on your own and have them turn on and off things. And uh, if somebody goes down this path and they want the flow, I'll be happy to rewrite it for them and share the flow with you. It's very easy to share flows. Um, and they came up with a web page going relay one, two, three, four off. Heck, you could have the node red care say, hey, if the radio goes to 40 meters, I want this relay active type of thing. So let's um, let's run through some control panels. This is my control panel right now. It needs a big facelift. But on the left, we've got all the all my relays. I have 16, but these are the only uh, eight or 10 I'm using. I've got probes on my Pi to read temperatures uh, on the amp tray, just how warm it is or, you know, SWR from the LP100, uh, my rotor headings, and uh, automatic stepper stuff, and uh, et cetera. Then we start to get carried away. So uh, this is uh, KK9, uh, KK9 November's thing. He's got graphs. Um, he can change all his antennas. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but if you're playing it back, you can pause and see a number of things. He's reading the frequency of the radio, uh, voltage meters, uh, LP100. And I don't know if he used my code or his own because it was pretty easy to parse. Cat, five con Cat 500 control for his Elecraft. Uh, somebody's using FR stack, which is a node red tool to integrate to his radios, brings a whole bunch of different things as well. And in, in our world too, we want everything keys off frequency. If I go to 30 meters, what do I want my configuration to look like? Oh, I got to remember to switch that antenna. Maybe my power needs to be only 50 watts or 30 watts uh, because some radios will accept power level controls to tune the power down, um, et cetera. Uh, HF auto antenna control uh, or tuner control, you know, again, on one page, web page. Uh, this is uh, Santiago, Hotel Indio 8, Sierra Mike X-Rays. He's written a lot of stuff as well uh, for his station. And whether it's ro local or remote, it doesn't matter. It's all web-based now. And uh, not everybody's put their call on it. Uh, I like the, you know, I use these graphs all the time to ping to see if I'm getting long latency on the internet. Uh, this is his Raspberry Pi control, uh, the temperatures, et cetera. Uh, another node red dashboard where this is controlling the slices. A slice is a virtual receiver or a, just a receiver uh, on a flex radio. So some radios have two, some have four, some have eight. Uh, they can change filter widths. Uh, you can do anything. I'm actually waiting for someone to write a node red client uh, for their flex radio. And it's only a matter of time. Weather center. And these are all people that are not serious programmers. Uh, Whiskey X-Ray 7 Yankee. This is Brett, Brett, Brent, and uh, a whole bunch of different things. And by the way, we've we've also seen a lot of things. If, if you're colorblind, uh, not uncommon for a manufacturer to send something out with red in it. Uh, and, uh, and that's, of course, hard for you to read. So you can make your own high contrast green, change your fonts, make it really big, really small. I, I like really small fonts, but, you know, most of, as we get older, we like really bigger fonts. So, And here's some more. I'll just toss through them. So there's just so many different options. Uh, stepper control. Whiskey 9, uh, Kilo X-Ray Quebec. Uh, you can start turning on alarms and warnings for temperatures. I really should do that on mine. If the temperature in the box gives about 30 Celsius, it, maybe it needs to text me to pay attention because my fans have failed. Uh, Whiskey 9, uh, Kilo X-Ray Quebec. Uh, he's got control for his SBE amplifier, uh, et cetera. Uh, this is Dave, WO2X with his, uh, he's got a widescreen like me. He's got one of these nice big widescreens, so it doesn't present well, but, you know, he's got all his control on top and his flex radio underneath. Uh, the Kilo Zero Victor Mike. And, this, and the nice thing is all these guys, they'll share this stuff with you. If somebody's written a W2 flow, they'll share it with you. And a bit of advertising, because yes, this is a, uh, Flex is also a sponsor. And as for that, if uh, you're interested in the radio, we actually have some coupon codes available. I'll put them here for a second. And um, we're pretty much at the end. Um, George or Rod, so if you have any questions, I can't see the chat at the moment.
Okay, Ron, do you have any questions on the chat? Um, I'm a little thin on questions on the chat. Um, I, I don't know if anybody wants to type in at the last second. Well, I, I have a couple. Actually, I have too many questions. So uh, one question I've got, Mike, is if if someone else has done this kind of Node Red stuff and you want to get their program, what form does it actually take? Like, what do you get? It's actually amazingly simple. They they copy it into their clipboard and they send it to you in an email. What is it? It's but, it's JSON. Oh, okay. So there there's a it's stored as there, it's a file and then you just load it on your. Yeah, it's all just regular character text. You know, heck, you could transfer it on packet radio if you wanted to. <laughs> it's surprisingly efficient too. They're not very big program. You know, the, I, they're like a couple of K, and uh, most people just paste them into the body of an email. Have you um, have you seen like other what, what, like the most exotic integration? I mean, I see a lot of the same things that people have done, but like what what sort of the more unusual kind of things you've seen people try to integrate? Um, we're seeing a lot of uh, the cool stuff now is, uh, hey, if I go to the CW band, if I dial down to like, you know, bottom end of 20, just reconfigure my radio. Okay, put it in CW. I want 400 hertz filters. So I want, oh, and I'm, by the way, I'm on 40. I want the preamps on. I drop down to 80. I want the preamps off. I'm on 160. I want the attenuators on. And, uh, and so as it starts out really simple, right? We turn a couple of relays on and go, well, geez, if I go... You know, if I leave the room, turn the relays to ground, you know, and, you know, that's starting to happen as, as uh, uh, Kyle out of St. Louis said, he got going on it and got, text me the next day. He says, I stayed up till 3 a.m. Not struggling because I was making huge progress, you know, so that we found that the learning curve is not really big, which is so much better than, you know, writing raw code because you've done it. I mean, at George's level, it's all embedded code. So it's okay. He doesn't have to worry about GUIs just to handle strings. But if you're, if you're an application developer, you've got to worry about the GUI. You got to now, okay, I got it going, but now I got to make the GUI look nice. And, and now you yeah, make your own a, GUI. Do, do, the, one of the reasons this is very appealing to me is that, is that I've, I've seen a lot of web UI environments for commercial products. And there's a very uh, a complicated set of software that you need. I mean, besides the web server, if you're gonna, if you're gonna have a, a you know, UI presentation, language, you're going to have a database. I mean, there's just a, there's a lot of stuff to wrap your head around. And this seems like it's, it's a pretty reasonable thing for anybody to attempt to do, which I guess is a key point that you're making. Yeah, absolutely. And I think if anybody's remotely interested, no pun intended or implied, um, grab a Raspberry Pi, order up that web switch, that four port revs, you know, relay uh, by Keystone, I think it was, and make that work. You know, and then use it to, I don't know, turn your, you know, whatever on and off. So uh, what, one specific question I, I was curious about, like a lot of the examples here are flex radios, and it seems like you could do the same thing with like your 7100 or a 7300 or whatever. It's just a different serial port string that has to be sent to that. Uh, absolutely correct. Because of, seven, you know, Yesu, anything that does RS-232 um, bi-directionally. So ICOM does, and... Um, I, we haven't had a big ICOM group, but I, I can't wait for them to get in there because ICOM's bus addressing is really going to work well on this, you know, because every radio has its own hex address. So, um, and I'm, I probably should go do some. I just haven't had time. Pull the 7100 out and, uh, or the 705. You know, yes, I work for Flex, but heck, I own a 705, 9700, the 7100. I'm still a ham. I still buy stuff. Um, I like my HF stuff where it is, but the other stuff's cool. And um, I probably should go to the 705 and start just reading data off it. Um, I'll have to build a um, TTL to RS-232 computer. Or I might have one in a box somewhere, but that's the only thing missing is someone just to say, okay, did you get it working? Can you read the frequency? That's all I want to do, right? And and then it, then you get carried away. So, so uh, um, one other question I, I have for you, it's some of those uh, meters, there's like power meters and stuff like that. Some data is pretty static, like the power's on or off. If it's on, you know, the light's on, right? It's not going to change for seven hours until you shut it off. But something like the RF power meter, that data is like changing constantly. So right. how do you deal with that? How do, frequently does that display update? What's practical? So that's the nice thing. I'm going to, the LP100 um, or any RS-232 watt meter is only as good as, it, as its sample rate, right? So if you read the meter once a second, you're going to get the power at that nanosecond. 
Um, the smarter meters, like, and there's the other name I can't think of, but the LP100 actually continues to do the math and will and will report peak power. Rod's not in his head because he's learned that lesson. Report its peak power over its longer sample rate, which gives you a much more better peak reading. Um, I read my watt meters every, because I've since I've upgraded the, offloaded the reading to the watt meter itself, I think every 500 mil, every half second. So you actually uh, see the meter like bouncing around. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. oh okay. And and but but you bring up a good point. I have a full meter for my twelve volt power, you know, bus meter. Well, you know, I don't really care if it's twelve or thirteen. I just want it to be there. What I really need to do is change that into an alarm and say it's below eleven or above fifteen, mm -hmm. right? And have it flash, you know, the whole red screen red or something going. So I, here's a whole other application for this that I'm very interested in also, and that is instrumenting our repeater site. Because, you know, anybody who's been a um, repeater administrator knows that, uh, well, for a lot of us, you can't get to the site conveniently, or maybe it's, maybe it's in a snowy mountaintop and you just can't get there for six months. And you want to know if something poops out, you want to know what failed so you know what to take to repair it. And uh, you'd also like to know when things are starting to go bad. So if, let's say you have a 100 watt repeater and it's putting out a nice solid 100 watts and everybody's happy. Well, if it starts putting out 85 watts, it, it, it sounds the same, but I'd really like to know that because it starts to tell me that maybe there's some water getting in the feed line or maybe the PA is starting to age or you know something is not quite right. And, and knowing that would be really useful. In fact, logging that would be even more useful. So are there facilities in there where you can log the data at periodic rates? Yeah, you could. You could. There's whole database access if you want. You could just write it out as a CSV file. And, you know, as a repeater operator, if I had this back when my repeater days, I think, you know, the first thing I'd be logging is current, you know, PA current. What, you know, what a story that would tell, right? You, you know, hey, I've got to go up with a new, you know, you know, the PA tripped off, didn't notice it, but it alarmed. And um, the Toronto FM communication side, we had a little bit of that, but we had to go, something's not right. And we had to go pull the binary down and then go through the telemetry and say, oh yeah, that voltage is a little off or is the sensor bad? You know. So, but yes, absolutely. And it's not complicated to write anymore, but uh, you, you got me going now. Now I got to get a current, you know, probe and I'm going to put it on my power supply because exactly that. Or more importantly, it should be no more than 20 watts and I'm drawing a lot more because yeah. I can give it. <laughs> Let's wait for the fire. So one of the first things that I look, look for too, by the way, on that repeater theme is uh, probably half a dozen times a year that I'm aware of, we lose power at the repeater site, which is the reason why we put in a backup battery system. And I would like to know when that happens. So even if the radio stays on, if the power goes away, I'd like to get a text message that tells me that the power, the AC power is out or when it comes back. You know, we did that too. We actually had the CW identifier drop to a different tone. Uh, that's how we knew the power went out. And um, there's, you know what, I'll be honest. There's no reason why you couldn't write a repeater control it in this in about 20 minutes, if you can handle the audio switching. And you know what, you could do it all with relays if you wanted to. It's maybe not pretty, but it's nothing wrong with it. I think Rod was going to say something. Yeah, I was going to ask a question further on the LP100, because there was discussion of that earlier on. Uh, somebody picked that out of one of your diagrams. Is it easier, harder to work with that as a measurement device? Oh, I think it was hugely easier. I have two uh, uh, Ellacraft Watt, two WT Watt meters for sale that I'm not using, but wonderful Watt meters, but this is just better. No, uh, you know, that's lab grade equipment, Rod. And I, I, it was easier for me to manage that than the Ellacraft Watt meter uh, because I had to keep sampling the, and I was worried about starting to load up the pie with the, um, LP100, I could just ask it every 500 milliseconds and I would get a valid number. And and to be honest, I don't really care if the number is 89 watts or 100 watts. I just want to make sure it's not three watts when I'm expecting 100 watts. You're looking for an indication, not a, a lab yeah, measurement. It, but it is that is a lab that is lab grade equipment. But yes. So how much is the LP watt meter? Uh, dual probes, 500 US. It's not cheap. So so here's a if if you want the homebrew version of something like that to consider. Yep. Um, so I, I was looking at doing a, a remote monitoring of the power for this, this reason a while back. And I was looking at different directional couplers and um, you can spend a boatload of money on really good commercial couplers. And I found a source that I thought was incredibly reasonable. 
And it's uh, another company that makes watt meters called WaveNode. I don't know if you're familiar with, with them, uh, but uh, the fellow Alan who, who runs WaveNode's great guy. And so I bought some of his sensors. So I, I actually don't have his watt meter, uh, but, I, but you can buy the sensors, the, the directional couplers by themselves. And he has them at different power levels at different bands, HF, VHF, UHF, et cetera. And what the directional coupler gives you is a voltage. So if you put power through it, it will give you a voltage that is uh, an indication of the forward RF power and on another pin, an indication of the reflected power. So for like a hundred bucks ish, you can just buy the directional coupler, take those two voltages and put them into the analog to digital converter on your GPIO board or whatever, and then Marcel have a little surfaces. table and tell you what the wattage is. There's one. And Marcel is sharing something on the screen. What is that? Marcel has to speak in order for his video to be seen and to be unmuted. It shows up on the video. But yeah, the directional coupler, would, like you said, with two BNC ports on it, they give you the voltage output. So same idea. Yep. Yeah, and that's a, yep. probably a surplus one you picked up somewhere along the way. So, it, you know, that, again, it is not, would probably be easy to do because all you have to do, like in the, let's say, for example, if with my GPIO board where you've got an Arduino and an ADC there, you could just take that voltage in, and then in the node red code, you can translate that voltage into, into watts, and then, then there you go for 100 bucks. I was actually going to ask you, uh, in, you know, could you pull the voltage off the Elecraft probes? Oh, Which yeah, actually, I, I, I've done that. Uh, yeah, okay. yeah I, I have the Elecraft directional coupler for their watt meter. And of course, I don't have their watt meter, but I have the directional coupler. Uh, the problem is that those directional couplers have frequency compensation built into the watt meter itself. Mm. The, the wave node couplers are flat. So in other words, um, over the frequency range of the device, you'll get a consistent voltage curve for the wattage. Um, so they did a really nice job of calibrating them so that it's a, that's the best probe to use for this application that I found that's reasonably priced. Perfect. So Mike, uh, one other question here around... Um, other devices, consumer devices even. Uh, is there libraries that we can use to, to get other things and devices like Zigbee or Z-Wave or things like that? Probably. So if you're sitting in front of your computer, oh, wait, you are. Go to nodered.org, I think it is. It's pretty easy to find. And then go to the library and just search on Zigbee and see what comes up. Okay. And, if, um, and I think you'll be surprised. Search on weather. Search on um, IO, there's a whole bunch of stuff. I think it's three or 4,000 flows people have, like you and I have written. And we haven't put the amateur stuff there. I guess we could. So think that's, and, and what about libraries good. for uh, cat commands, that kind of thing? Like kind of a um, ham lib for Node Red? Not that I've seen, but I think what we're doing is we, we really had talked about building, we need to build a library for different types of radios so people could, uh, but I don't think anybody in the groups yet figured how to build a, um, they're called nodes, how to actually build the node and says, you know, give me the, give me the Kenwood frequency node, you know, uh, they, you, we're still doing it sort of the hard way, but uh, I can see guys like Alan Blind pulling that off when he's up all night one night and just saying. Well, that'd be pretty easy. It. You could just, I mean, just sample the serial port and then decompose. I mean, Kenwood is, would be super easy because it's be just easy one. text. Yeah. Yeah. We just have to look through the cookbook and say, how do you create a, how do you create a node? How do you, you know, how do you create and publish the node? That's sort of the next So the, what you did to decode the response from my GPIO board, it's no more difficult than that. It's just correct format. So that'd be pretty straightforward. Okay, I, I think that's all the questions we had. There's a quick question about uh, logging the CSV files, but... Uh, oh, it's pretty uh, straightforward. It's just grab all your data and write it. It's, and you don't have to worry about file management. Or, the answer is yes. Uh, <laughs> yes, no problem. Okay. okay. Hey, thanks a lot, Mike. That, that's really interesting. And I, I'm, that's something else I have to put on my list to do in the near term. So thanks a lot for that.